So this is this is the uh, I'm calling it a short course on biblical interpretation, and um, the reason I'm calling it a short course is a because it's pretty short, but b because um, when my grandfather was doing uh, classes on um, bib or not on on just kind of mere Christianity, what it means to be a Christian in the 1960s and 70s, he called it a short course. <laughs> So I'm so I'm following up in in my own way, um, and this is a very different from what he was doing, um, except for that it's um, so it's different from what he was doing, except that uh, uh, it's it's you know a small thing for us to get together and just kind of what does it mean to interpret the Bible? So let's go to the next slide. So this is kind of the organizing principle that I've set out for us. This is a, a French, um, he's a literary theorist. His name is Pierre Bourdieu. And it comes from his book, The Logic of Practice. And um, I want this to kind of be our organizing principle for our, our whole discussion over the next several weeks about biblical interpretation. And he says, there's only a perspective seeing, only a perspective knowing and the more affects we allow to speak about one thing, the more eyes, different eyes, we can use to observe one thing, the more complete will be our concept of this thing, our objectivity. So if I was to interpret that, <laughs> what, it, what he's saying is that none of us as subjective people can get at the whole truth of anything that we look at. And the more voices that we allow into our space, our interpretive space, the more, um, the more different um, ideas and the more different perspectives that we get, the more complete our concept of a thing will be. So, so a lot of times in biblical interpretation, what we do is we have these methodologies that we use to try and figure out what's the text saying or what does the text mean? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times scholars will get kind of hunkered down into one thing and they specialize in that. And that makes sense because um, for a lot of these things, you have to be specialized to be able to, tell, to say anything about it. But as time goes on, what we see is using intersectional models of methodology, meaning using more than one at a time, can actually help you tell more and get more out of what you're looking at. Not only that, but as we, you know, when we did our, um, when we did our class, the theological reflection class um, during Lent, mm -hmm. what we did is we used all of our individual understandings of our lives and where we're coming from. And when we did that, we actually open up more possibilities of what the text can mean. And we actually inform one another of what a text can mean. So I'm so so that's why I, I bring up Pierre Bourdieu. I also use him a little bit later um, in, in our discussion. So there are a couple of key terms. And as we go through um, each week, I'm going to set out what is the interpretive model that we're looking at this week? Mm -hmm. What does it entail? And then we're always going to try and come back to try and apply it. And our key terms for this week are decoding, interpreting, speech act, natural understanding, or habitus. Those, those are two synonymous terms. Natural, I put that in quotes, natural understanding and habitus. Mm -hmm. So... So it's decoding, mm -hmm. interpreting, mm -hmm. speech act, natural understanding, mm -hmm. slash habitus. 
And habitus can be both uh, singular and plural. And Pierre Bourdieu uses them in both uses it in both ways. So let's talk about decoding. So when we're talking about biblical interpretation, some of our methodologies I would I would suggest are actually decoding rather than interpreting a text. Mm -hmm. And so decoding is thinking that there is a specific message or messages that can be pulled out of the text if you use proper reasoning and believing that the questions of the text can be answered and known. So if I were to put that a little bit more simply, decoding is you're going into a text assuming that there's one message and that if you use the proper tools, you can get the very specific message that was meant that you were meant to get out of the text. The ultimate goal of decoding is to discover a thing that the author or God, in the case of the Bible, secretly placed and intended for you to find in the text. You're a treasure hunter. Now, I would say that interpreting, on the other hand, is thinking that there are any number of ways to read and understand a text. And so you set out to discover one or more possible ways that the text can be understood. So I'll say that maybe a little more simply. Interpreting is realizing that there are multiple ways that a text can be understood. And your job as the interpreter is to try and discover one or more of the ways that the text can be understood. The ultimate goal of interpreting, as far as I'm concerned, is to listen for God's voice through the text and discover what God might be saying to you now, whether or not we know what the author's context or intent was. So we're not looking for what the author was trying to tell us necessarily. We're listening for the voice of God. And I think the beautiful thing about, about this is that over time you notice that the way you interpret a text changes. You know, depending on how old you are, what experiences you've had, um, all kinds of factors that, are, that, that happen in your life. What happened to you the day that you read the text? What happened to you the week that you read the text? All these things factor into how you interpret the text, and that changes over time. So even in your own life experience, there will be multiple ways that you can understand the text. And I think that's the beauty of interpretation, mm -hmm. rather than decoding. I, now, I will say, I think decoding has a place. I think it brings up really, it can bring up really interesting things, and some of our methodologies will be more in that vein, like more decoding type of vein. So, um, as as we get towards the other key um, uh, key terms, I'm I just kind of want to set out. A biblical interpretation based on this idea of decoding and, inter and interpreting. So the Bible, when we bring this to the Bible, because you can in, you can decode or interpret any text, like people do paintings, books, um, music, any anything that somebody that somebody creates can be interpreted. And the Bible is one of the most significant collections of writings I would say ever composed by human beings. And that is the case because. It's the foundational, it has the foundational ideas and it has the self vivid words that have empowered billions upon billions of people over 2,000 years. That's what gives the Bible its significance. And it continues to empower, inspire, and inform billions of people on the earth today and will continue to do. It contains stories that are sacred in all three Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And it's even used among people who don't claim a faith 
whatsoever, and sometimes by other faith traditions. Uh, so I think the Mormons sometimes will use the will use our Bible, um, and and they consider it they consider it theirs, even though their main text is the Book of Mormon. The Bible has been quoted and referenced by literary masters, by artistic savants, by ordinary people in their daily lives for millennia. Especially you think about the old Negro spirituals. Mm -hmm. Those are some powerful uses and references of biblical texts. Of all the millions of books that authors um, have put down their thoughts for the for us to read, the Bible is still held as one of the most is still held as one of the most important books ever written. So decoding and interpreting are always a process of filling in gaps. So that's what we're doing. When we decode or we interpret, we're filling in gaps where what we experience or read or feel or see leaves some sort of ambiguity between different possible meanings. So that can happen in a book, it can happen in a painting, it can happen in a song. Any of the myriad ways that we are that we find a thing that we need to decode or interpret we're filling in gaps where we don't understand exactly what the other person meant in our biblical context we are usually dealing with speech acts and that's our next key term mm -hmm. a speech act is a story a concept an idea an ideology etc anything like that that we encounter through language so anything that we encounter through language this can also be visual language. All speech acts have to be decoded to be understood. From the simplest text message to an IKEA instruction manual or a road sign to the most in complex scientific treatise or what Einstein says about the theory of relativity, speech acts only gain significance or cultural capital. That means that people buy into what the person has said if the receiver can take the information and apply it. That's where, that's where a speech act gets its power. It gains its significance by the receiver being able to take the information and use it. The act of decoding a speech act then is an act of interpretation. We're filling in the gaps. So most of the time, interpretation of speech acts seems to happen automatically. We don't notice that we're doing it. This means that interpretation can often seem natural to us. And that's the next key term, is the natural interpretation. It can seem natural to us. We didn't actually interpret it at all, is what we think. That's just the way it is. And for less complex speech acts, the natural interpretation may very well help us to apply the decoded information correctly, safely, or beneficially without a need to consider other possible interpretations. For more complex speech acts though, especially ones upon which we place our hope for salvation or our health and our safety, the natural, and I put in quotes natural, the natural interpretation, if it is incorrect or harmful, could lead to unintended, unhelpful, or dangerous outcomes. So, so what I'm saying is for, for kind of simple things that we have to interpret, and we'll, we'll, when we get to the application section, we'll look at one of these. The natu your kind of natural or your kind of like uh, ingrained, your kind of ingrained interpretation that you understand is fine. You'll do, you'll, you'll, you'll enact and apply the speech act the way it's supposed to be applied. But for, for things that are more complex, and especially things that have to do with our very salvation, what seems natural to you may not be helpful, it may not be beneficial, and it might be dangerous. Okay. So you can either you can either um, you can either do this like literally right now, or you, we can do this as kind of a, a thought experiment. Um, but if you have your phone, um, can you find a picture of yourself from more than six months ago, or think of a picture that? or you can just do it as you can just do it as a as a mental kind of exercise but if you were to look at a picture of yourself from six months ago this is 
I didn't tell you this was going to be interactive, did I? <laughs> yeah, take a picture, a picture of yourself. Because what I, what I, and I'll tell you why I'm, why I'm doing this. I want to see if you can interpret or decode something that you're a part of. <laughs> that's close enough just a just a couple of months okay or else i can think of something. or think of something okay so so the point is you have this you have this thing that you are in you are there okay so i'm going to ask you some interpretive questions about this picture Okay, so here are some simple questions. Who is in the picture? What were you doing? Okay, those are kind of really simple questions that when you look at a picture of yourself, you should be able to say, I know who, who I know who's in the picture because it was six months ago, and I know basically what I was doing. Here are some more complex memory questions that you might ask yourself. What were you thinking when the picture was taken? What had you done before the picture was taken? What were you about to do next after the picture was taken? What did you eat that day? What was the best thing about that day and what was the worst thing about that day? Now these are more complex because you can't just look at the picture and know these things. It requires memory. Mm -hmm. Now here are some ridiculous questions that you shouldn't know how to answer <laughs> about this picture. What was the first thing you said after the picture was taken and who did you say it to? What was your favorite word that day? <laughs> All right. Moving on from the ridiculous, let's move to the interpretive questions. Actually, and I should uh, let me get to the the, the screen because I, I actually. So here's what we're we're at the personal photograph part. Here are the interpretive questions. What kind of camera was used, and what effect does that have on the picture? Was it taken from an iPhone? Was it taken from a Nikon? Was it taken from a. a a temporary camera, um, like a Polaroid. Mm -hmm. How was this picture edited and what does that say about our society? Is an interpretive question. Mm -hmm. What are the power dynamics in the picture? So if you're pictured with somebody else, is there a hierarchy that you feel as the, one of the people involved? How does that show up? How does this picture reflect what you remember about yourself from that time in your life? Sometimes we can look back at pictures and we can say, I know exactly what I was going through at that moment. And we'll interpret parts of our life based on that. What do you learn about yourself by looking at this picture? When you look at yourself in that picture, does it tell you something about yourself? The way you were smiling the way you weren't smiling, the way your body was being held in a particular position. Does that tell you something about what was happening within you in that picture? The next question, this is a spiritual autobiography question. Where was God in your life when this picture was taken? Sometimes we can look at pictures and we can see something in there and we'll remember something about that event and in our spiritual autobiography, that might be a significant moment for us. It may be a regular moment. But you may say, God was in my life in that particular, based on the power dynamics that were involved or some other way that I interpret the picture. And then the final, final one, and of course it's not an exhaustive list, but these are just examples. What does this picture say about issues of justice in your society? So if you're standing with a particular person, 
um, that has, a, and there's a hierarchical structure or a power difference that might tell you something about, about justice in our society. Or I've, I've been in pictures with kids who are in the juvenile justice system. And the way that that picture turns out sometimes will tell me something about, I can learn something about our overall juvenile justice system and our overall justice system. By say, if I was standing with an 11 year old kid rather than a 16 year old kid. So the point for any of these questions, from the simplest to the most complex, to the silliest, to the interpretive, whatever you don't remember specifically, you have to fill the gap or leave that question unanswered. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So when we're doing these interpretive questions, we have, we have um, certain gaps in our memory and certain gaps in actually looking at the picture, what it can tell us. You know, people say a picture is worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of those thousand words are interpretation because I usually don't remember what thought was going through my head when somebody snapped a photo. I usually don't remember what the next word I said or what my favorite word of the day was. I definitely in the moment am not thinking, where is God in my life right now? How will I think about this in six months? And you can do this with pictures. If you took a, if you looked at a picture of yourself from 40 years ago, it's even more, it's more difficult. And more, there are more gaps because you may have forgot who the other person in the picture was. You may have, for, you, you, you don't remember what it was like to be you on a daily basis. So when we don't have the information, we have to fill in the gaps. So how much did you end up knowing about yourself and your own history in that photo that you looked at? Any, and anybody can answer this. And I don't know if we have people online who are answering, who are answering any of these questions. I don't have the chat open. Say that again. So how much did you end up knowing about your own self and your own history when you looked at this picture or imagined this picture? Would you say you knew more about yourself than you thought you would or less as I kept asking questions? I knew more of what gives me peace. Okay. And I'm thinking of, and I don't really have a good picture, but I'm, I'm picturing us um, in Virginia. Okay. Overlooking the Blue Ridge Mountains. Okay. And, you know, and that, that was a sense of peace for that day. Okay. Um, and it was just the three of us. So that was, to me, it was very powerful because it was the way the, the way the sun was shining off of the mountain. Mm -hmm. So that was, and I think my thoughts of that and I, I just kind of said a prayer mm -hmm. for our health, for, for the family. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it, it, that's one that just kind of just pops out. Yeah. You know. Was there anything that you, that you think you, you didn't know or couldn't recreate about that moment? I didn't know that with with the way George and I kind of worked and my daughter's working and all, I didn't know we, we could come to the point where we knew how to mm. and just enjoy ourselves. Okay. And that was that was good to know that <laughs> with all the hustle and bustle and the this and the that, and mm -hmm. you know. And so no matter what happened before that moment, mm -hmm. say somebody tripped on a rock on the way to the top of the mountains mm -hmm. and shouted mm -hmm. out a cuss word, maybe. Mm -hmm. That disappears into the background. Right. And I don't think if that was the case, mm -hmm. because I was so in tuned in, in self and us, mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't even notice it. Mm -hmm. Or if I did notice it, I would have ignored it because it wasn't important. It wasn't important. Mm -hmm. That's great. 
could the way that you interpret this photo change over time? Now that's a pretty strong memory. It is. Think about a photo where you don't actually remember that much. So, so how about this? Do you have any pictures of yourself from college? Yeah. Yeah. So when you're in college, say you were at a party in college and somebody snapped a photo. When you're in college, you're probably like, yeah, those, those are all my friends. This is great. I love this. I love who I was. I was free. And you have all these kind of things that you think about the college. Mm -hmm. 20 years later, let's say that picture was put on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> How will you now interpret that picture? Mm -hmm. What if 40 years from now, what if you were doing something embarrassing, something that didn't embarrass you when you were in college because you didn't know any better? But now 40 years later, you're like, oh, maybe, maybe pictures of me doing a keg stand aren't that as cool as I thought. <laughs> I'm not speaking from personal experience. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you tell them yourself. <laughs> but, but listen, when we're on Facebook, that's a possibility, isn't it? You get all these things saying, remember this? Mm -hmm. Have you ever gotten a Facebook one that says, remember this from 10 years ago? You're like, ooh, <laughs> I wish... I wish I'd gotten a different haircut, you know, or I would, you know, all kinds of things. The way you interpret a picture over time can change. So this, this is all to get us in the mindset of, okay, if we're interpreting something that is our own, something that we are a part of, and yet there are still some things that we can't know for certain, there are still gaps that we need to fill and interpret or decode. How can, well can we know somebody else's, what, when somebody else does something, does a speech act, writes something, draws us a picture? How much can we know about the internal working of their thoughts when they were doing it? You can try. You can try. try but... so, so this is the kind of, this is the kind of crux that gets us into biblical interpretation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we can't know ourselves that well, and if our interpretation of ourselves changes over time, right. if I read a book that was written 10 years ago and I still have some of the context of that book, of what was happening, mm -hmm. then I can say a little bit more about it. But what about a book 2,000 years ago and I have no idea what the context was? Mm -hmm. and, I don't, and I don't have any access to what life was like on a regular basis for those people. How much can I actually know? How much can I decode? And if I do decode it, how do I know that it's true? Right. So the next big question, and let me change the slide over. The next big question is, if we don't even know ourselves all the time, how much can we claim to know other people? And so that's what we're going to explore for the, for the rest. So how do we interpret another person's words? How do we know what another person means when they speak or write? Is there ever confusion between what someone means and what we hear? And we can have this in personal relationships too. How often has somebody said something or you said something to somebody else and they misinterpreted it and took it the complete wrong way? Mm -hmm. How about if the person we're speaking to comes from a different culture? Even more gaps appear between what we can know about what they meant. How do we know what an author means when they write? What if we can't ask them anymore? Sometimes you can go to these you can go to these author uh, book signings and stuff, and you can ask them, "What did you mean when we wrote when you wrote that?" Mm -hmm. And they, sometimes the answer is, "Well, this is what I meant." Mm -hmm. So like I was reading, there's this book called The High Mountains of Portugal by Jan Martel. Mm -hmm. He wrote um, The Life of Pi. And he did a series of, he did a series of mm -hmm. um, kind of book signings where he mm -hmm. talked about this book, The High Mountains of Portugal. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he said, I never would have been able to decode this by myself, mm -hmm. is that the plot of the book follows 
the you know how in the bible they have like the headings for each of the sections mm -hmm. like jesus tells the good samaritan story and then it goes like that mm -hmm. well the book actually <laughs> follows and is plotted along those those markers in the gospel of mark mm -hmm. and so he did encode that into the, into the novel and if you look for that then you can decode it mm -hmm. right you can mm -hmm. decode how the plot works but you most people would not have just pulled that out of the air. So we have access to him. He can tell us this, mm -hmm. that he was referencing another work. But what about the ancient biblical books? We don't have access to those authors or those scribes. We can't ask them, what did you think you were doing when you did this? How much can we actually know about the original context then? And then the next question is, how can we know it? So now I want to I want to bring in and we're going to use these we're going to use these um, basically and I'm going to run through them. Um, I'll, I'll try and go pretty slowly, but um, don't get caught up on them because we're going to actually see them. We're going to put them into practice um, at, right after this. So the the questions, the interpretive questions when you're working with a text. Oh, what happened to my slideshow? OK, maybe these are my questions. then. OK, so. So the underlying premise of interpreting another person's words, the first things we can ask is who wrote or who spoke? Like who did the speech act? So then we ask questions like, do we know who they were individually? Which brings up questions of authorship. Where do they come from? What is their social or cultural location? Meaning if, if there's a hierarchical system, were they, you know, poor monks sitting in a cave somewhere? Or were they like rich and powerful scribes who were, who were given all the things that they needed by being part of the temple complex in Jerusalem? What is our relationship to them if we know who they are? And what authority or power do they have in their society? over their culture, over us. Some of these questions we can answer and some of them we can't. So I was working on, um, on the authorship in the Book of Lamentations. And most people after about the fifth century and even as early as the second century BCE, but as, as late as the fifth century CE, all everybody attributed the book of lamentations to the prophet jeremiah hmm. but that doesn't necessarily mean jeremiah wrote <laughs> lamentations yeah. but how we interpret lamentations if we say that who wrote it was mm -hmm. jeremiah it changes the way we interpret the, the text mm -hmm. there are all kinds of ways and i won't go into them in depth but there are all kinds of ways that who wrote it or who we think wrote it affects mm -hmm. the way we interpret it so that's one way we interpret another person's words. Who are they? Mm -hmm. The next one is what are the actual words that they used? So part of interpreting is, as in the Pierre Bourdieu example from the beginning, we have his actual words that he wrote. So we have the text. So one thing we might ask is what language are the words in? Right? So if we're looking at the, the Hebrew Bible, if we're looking at it in the Hebrew, then we're going to interpret it a specific way. If we look at one of the 20 million translations of the Hebrew Bible into English or any other language, mm -hmm. and we see the differences between those, those will make us interpret the Bible in a different way also because of the word choice of the translator. Next question, do we speak that language? Or can we read that language? Then as far as what words are used, are any of the words, are any of the words ambiguous? Are they multivalence? And what, what I mean by multivalence is can they carry multiple meanings? Are they abstract concepts like love?
And then the last thing in this is, is the sentence structure simple or complex? Is it, is it Jane is running? Or is it Jane is running because she fell in love with a boy and his name was Max. And Max was the sweetest boy that Jane ever met. Right, and then we start piling on other things. So we can have simple sentences and we can have complex sentences. And that affects how we interpret a text. The next big, the kind of next big question is what is the context? So within the text, where is, where is this happening if it's a narrative? Who is speaking or being spoken to? And what do we have to know for their statement to make sense? So pulling this back from, from pulling this back from the Bible, if we were just trying to interpret, if somebody just yelled something at us, just out in public, somebody yelled something, where is this happening? Where are we? Are we in front of a police station? <laughs> you know, are we in front of St. Andrews? Are we in a meeting at our professional environment? Are we at a church meeting? You know, all the context will will help us determine how to interpret what the other person is saying. Also, who is being spoken to? So is the person speaking to you or are they speaking to somebody else? Sometimes if you're in public, that might not always be clear. Somebody, have you ever been in a situation where somebody was talking to you, but you were thinking they were talking to somebody else <laughs> until they just really insisted and got your attention? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, so, so if it's, we tend to ignore it. We don't need to interpret the other person's words if it's not aimed at us or if it doesn't concern us. Mm -hmm. And then what do we have to know to make their statement make sense? So if they're talking about, if you ever had a conversation with somebody um, that was talking complete nonsense or like um, uh, this would happen at, at Melanie's church in Washington, D.C., where there were a lot of, there were, they had a lot of homeless people in the congregation mm -hmm. and a lot of homeless people who, who hung around, like 200 homeless people came to their eight o'clock service mm -hmm. and they would feed them a meal every week. Mm -hmm. But there were a lot of people with mental illness. And so if you went outside to talk to somebody, sometimes you could have a good conversation with them. But if they were having like a, a if they're having like a psychological break, mm -hmm. or if they, or if they, um, or if they had a certain type of mental illness, what they said to you might make zero sense mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. Because you would have to know what's going on inside their brain to make the connections that they're making. So in order to make their speech act make sense to you, you have to have a certain context. Mm -hmm. That's a kind of that's a kind of radical example, I think. Mm -hmm. But the next thing is, and and this is one of our key terms is what is or what are your habitus or habitus? And this is Pierre Bourdieu talks about habitus as what are the things that by being you you take as natural. You remember we talked about things being natural? So based on your socioeconomic location in your culture, based on your language, based on what kind of car you drive, um, based on what your profession was, um, based on what the culture around you tells you about yourself. So when we, we, we could talk about race as this kind of thing, um, what your what your kind of your hobby to your race is part of your hobby to it's where you're coming from and you can have multiple hobby twos because in one sense as, as you could be a church person and you have a certain hobby to as a church person as a teacher you might have a certain hobby to and you know you operate operate in different ways depending on what context you are in your life does that make sense so, so sometimes you're a different person depending on what you are so uh, for me maybe let's say when I go home, I'm dad. And the way I'm dad and the way that I operate and the habitus I have as a dad is different than the habitus I have when I'm sitting in the library or when I'm performing the Eucharist as a priest, right? Or when I'm at home with my mom and all of a sudden I'm son instead of dad. We all operate in different habitus. 
okay? And those affect the way that you interpret. Have you ever been brought up short, like, by, like there's been a biblical interpretation, and I'll tell you mine, one of mine, is um, I, we all, we all um, in the church talk about the crucifixion, right? And I understand that from my habitus, from where I'm sitting in a, in a particular way, and it's been interpreted to me by other people, by priests, by Bible studies I've been in, in a, in a particular way. And then I came to James Cone's The Cross and the Lynching Tree. I personally, from my habitus as a white man, probably would never have thought about the connection between the cross and lynching. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But for James Cone as a black man who is doing post-colonial um, post interpretation, which is one of the interpretations we'll get into, mm -hmm. it was readily obvious that these two things should go together. Yeah. It was part of his hobby too. Yeah. So, and, and we see this, and this is why some, when, when we get to later in this series, we'll talk about um, post-colonial and other kind, and, uh, and post-colonial, feminist, womanist, other kinds of, um, interpretive strategies mm -hmm. that really are centered on what is a person's habitus and how can we learn from that person. So the way we interpret will be different than somebody in China interprets, different than somebody in South America interprets, different than somebody who um, who is a Hispanic Episcopalian living in Forest Park in the same city that we live in. Their habitus is different than ours in certain ways. And so they might have different interpretations. So the questions for this hobby too is, who am I? What assumptions go into my determination of meaning? How do the systems of meaning making around me inform my understanding of this? So I live in a capitalist system. Does that in some way affect the way that I view the Bible? That buying land from another person is a natural thing? Whereas for Isaiah, it was a problematic thing, right? Am I going to understand the Jubilee year where everything goes back to the original owners after, after 50 years as a good thing? Or do I, am I going to have to go through mental loops to make that work because my capitalist mindset says, mm -hmm. you don't just give things away <laughs> that you spent 50 years building up and accumulating. The next big question, kind of highlighted question, is how do I apply this for interpretation? So how does this affect my future action? That's an interpret that's an interpretive thing. When I hear somebody say something to me and I interpret it, how is that going to affect my future action? What might I do or how might I react or respond given this information? How, the, how will this make me feel about myself or others hearing this information? And what did I learn? So this is important for the interpretive, for the for interpreting somebody else's words. Because if we only ever stayed in our own habitus, then we're never we don't actually learn anything. And we don't actually change. We just get stuck in our ways. So, and the final big kind of highlighted question that I have is what was the result of my interpretation? And this is different from the application because what I mean here is, did my interpretation and application of my interpretation lead to safety, benefit, goodness, or truth? And that's not an exhaustive list, but safety, benefit, goodness, or truth. So what was the result? The other thing is, it could be, did my interpretation put me in danger, physical, spiritual, or mental? In which case, I might have to change my interpretation. You know, did I learn something? Did I fortify something I already knew? Did I ameliorate something? Did I augment my understanding of something? Did I clear something up? Did I have an epiphany? Did I add value? Did I find something interesting about my own identity? 
when we're filling in these gaps to an interpreting what to, to decide whether our interpretation was successful we want to know these kinds of things what was it what's what was the final effect will this interpretation help me to change something that needs to be changed so I was I was talking to somebody and I won't say any names but I was talking to somebody um, at, who after my sermon had reconciled with somebody and so the way that we interpreted the text as a community and the way that she interpreted my what I said led to successful implementation right so she she applied it and then something got better you know so that's the so that's i think the purpose of interpretation mm -hmm. and and the real harm that can be done when you don't interpret something in a proper way and the reason why we need so many different and like Borgia said at the beginning so many different objectivities so many different ways to get out of our subjectivity our own habitus mm -hmm. different ways of listening to other people and hearing interpretations is because when we do that we're more likely to have a successful interpretation rather than something that causes harm so you think of people who interpret the Bible to say that all other religions are bad. And then people burning Qurans, right? Mm -hmm. And then people getting killed because somebody burnt a Quran. So like if, if somebody burns a Quran in the United States, Christians in Pakistan, Christians in Afghanistan, Christians in Iraq, Christians in North Africa are put in danger because of that interpretation. So, so that, so it's really, so that's really important that the result of the interpretation, I think is a really important thing to factor in, mm -hmm. right? We don't, you know, how many times have passages about, passages about, um, that we take as, um, saying that people have traditionally taken as saying that LGBTQ plus people are evil or bad or sinful. And the result of that interpretation is damage, trauma, a feeling of being less than, of not being loved. When That's God right. wants love, for, in our interpretation, God love, wants love and wholeness for everybody, right? So the result of the interpretation also matters. Okay, so now we get to the fun part. We have, uh, we have 15 minutes or so left, and this is, the, this is the application section. So this is where we take these ideas of decoding, interpreting, of our kind of natural understanding or hobby twos, um, and we're gonna we're gonna try and um, we're gonna try and put this into action. So the first one is a simple. I'm gonna this is gonna be a simple one. Consider a stop sign in traffic as a speech act. Okay, it uses language. It has a syntax, right? With it when it's written, it's a simple syntax. Like we discussed earlier, some things are simple sentences and some things are complex. This is a one word sentence, right? Okay. What does it mean to interpret this correctly? So let's think about it. Who wrote the stop sign? We don't know, right? It's anonymous, okay? Where does, where does the person who wrote it come from? <laughs> okay, but if we, but now that we've said it's anonymous, we know something about the anonymous that, that put it into, that put it up, right? Mm -hmm. We know about the system that created the stop sign. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have a particular person, but we fill in that gap with anonymous, mm -hmm. right? Because we know that somebody had to have done it. Just like the ancient biblical writer said, well, there must have been first a couple first humans. Let's call them Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. Because we know intellectually there had to be a, the way that human like biology works, there had to be an original pair, right? So we know that somebody had to do that. And we know that it was, so we, we put, kind of put in this anonymous, right? We don't know who they were, but we know that it came about. Somebody at some point said, you know what would make traffic a lot safer? Stop signs. Okay, so 
what do we know about their social and cultural location? Hmm. What is and what is our relationship to, to them? What kind of authority power do they have over us? We can answer those questions, can't we? Yeah. So we know that their social location is institutional, let's say, just simply. And we know that they have the authority and power to enforce their speech act because they employ people to enforce their speech act, right? Also, just culturally speaking, we know that when people run, people don't want to get hit when they're in traffic. So there's also, there's also a force just in the fact that we, that we think that we agree to this, even mm -hmm. if nobody's watching us, yeah. right? Okay, so we talked about what words were used. Not very multivalence, right? There aren't multiple meanings to stop, mm -hmm. right? It's not ambiguous. It's not an abstract concept. <laughs> so what is the context? <laughs> we're in a car or maybe on a bike, or maybe we're walking. We have to know when we're doing that, but we're out on the street somewhere. We're the one being spoken to, mm -hmm. right? And everybody else around us. And the thing that we have to know in order to make the statement make sense is, is everything that we've come to know that we've internalized about traffic patterns, about the danger of cars. Mm -hmm. So these are things that if you, if you were an alien coming from another planet, <laughs> and you saw a stop sign and you didn't know all the danger of cars, if you came out of, if, if you were an ancient person and you kind of got swept into modern society and you saw a stop sign mm -hmm. and you didn't realize that cars can go 70 miles per hour and you weren't expecting something to just come flying at you because mm -hmm. everything in your world goes 12 miles per hour. <laughs> <laughs> You have to know a little bit to make, even, even with a stop sign, you have to know a little bit to make the statement make sense. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I, I don't want to kind of like keep going on this, but we could go right. through all the rest of the questions and we could answer them. But the most important thing about a stop sign is our application of the speech act, mm -hmm. right? How we apply our interpretation, right? Mm -hmm. And some people interpret stop signs differently. Some, in, some, some interpret them as a yield. Some, some interpret them as a stop light and then forget that there's no green. <laughs> there are, so that you wonder, you know, what are people thinking when they don't stop? Yeah. You then have to interpret, interpret yeah. what they're right. doing mm -hmm. in the traffic pattern. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been at a stop sign where both people are just like, you go, you go, you the, go. Right, right. You're having to, that's a, that's a, that's a more complex interpretation of the stop sign. But the result is the the important thing is that when you apply your interpretation of the stop sign, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it was a successful interpretation. If you didn't get in the car accident, right. it was an unsuccessful interpretation. If you got into a car accident or God forbid you hit somebody. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Let's move on to another one. How about this? Now, th now this one is a personal example. So Tyrone Yates, I'm going to quote him talking to my children or talking to me. So, so he's talking to me, Chris, your boys had a one star Sunday at church today. Chris, your boys had a one star Sunday at church today. Okay. So who is speaking? Do we know the individual? Mm -hmm. It's Tyrone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, where do they come from? He's, he's from Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. He lives in our church. What is his social and cultural location? Mm -hmm. We could say he's the senior warden of the church, although that might go under authority and power, but mm -hmm. um, he's a judge. Um, he's a member of the church, of the congregation. Um, there are all kinds of things that we could, that, that help us to understand who Tyrone is. Okay. What is our relationship to him? Well, he's a fellow in this circumstance, he's a fellow church member. Okay. What authority or power does Tyrone have in this situation when he does this speech act toward me? 
I mean, well, okay. So then we talk about he's the senior warden in different yeah. churches. Now in different churches and different hobby twos, yeah. that means different things because right. the church has a culture too. Sure. In our, so, but you need to know that because if you're coming out of a church where the senior warden has more power than the priest, mm. or if you're coming from a church where the priest has more power than the senior warden, mm. that statement could mean different things. We could mm. interpret it different ways. I could interpret it different ways. If I was the priest in a system where the senior warden had could just like fire me off the top of his head if he wanted, mm -hmm. then there's more danger in interpreting it incorrectly. Mm -hmm. Now, in our church, Tyrone and I have a great relationship and we 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 try to keep each other on an even playing field. Mm -hmm. I defer to him on things, on certain things, and he defers to me on certain things. So the authority and power in this situation is is even. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what words were used? What language are the words in? So he spoke to me in English. Mm -hmm. We speak that language. Are any of the words ambiguous, multivalence, or abstract concepts? So here's so here's why I brought this example up. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean? So Chris, your boys had easy to understand. A one star Sunday at church day. What's the ambiguous part of that sentence? How do you interpret the stars? What does it mean to be a one, one star, star Sunday? Yeah, exactly. So that's the gap in our understanding, the gap that we need to fill in, the gap that needs to be interpreted. The rest of it's very simple. Mm -hmm. Right? As far as the as far as the syntax. Mm -hmm. So it it's a relatively simple sentence, but one of the ideas is ambiguous. Okay, so where was this happening? It's happening in church. Mm -hmm. Who's being spoken to? I'm being spoken to. He's not talking to the boys, so sometimes he does say this to the boys. <laughs> and then what do we have to know to make this statement make sense about the stars? You have to know the system. You have yeah. to know the system. system. Yeah. Which is one star his system? It, is it his system or is it my exactly. system? Exactly, right. So, um, and then, and then does he have the authority to give stars or not give stars? <laughs> yes. well, right. <laughs> so we have to know, we have to know, oh, we have to know at a very basic level, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how many stars are in the system, mm -hmm. right? What's the scale? Right. I was going to say, one star, five stars, but yeah. Right. Yeah. If you get one out of 10 stars, that's vastly different than getting one out yeah. of two stars, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or one out of one stars, but an extra star would be bonus, which is actually what the system is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? But if you just heard that yeah. and you were and you were and you were coming in after church and you just heard Tyrone say to me, Chris, the boys had a one star Sunday, mm -hmm. and you immediately in your in your star system from your hobby tooth mm -hmm. said, Well, when we do stars it's one out of five. Mm -hmm. That's terrible. Mm -hmm. But it could be the gold stars. Right. Right. So, right. but this is what I mean about the habitus mm -hmm. is that from your, the way you might initially interpret that mm -hmm. comes from your understanding of what star systems are. Mm -hmm. And you might not have an understanding of star systems if you come from outside of the United States or outside of mm -hmm. Cincinnati or whatever the culture, the culture around star system. Well, when you first said it, I thought, well, that doesn't nice. See? Exactly. So you interpret it as a negative. I did. Yeah. I was like, I'm like okay. <laughs> so, so I think we can, so we can see, so we can see how our hobby tooth affects our interpretation of that. Right. Right. So then, so and then. You know, that's something I used to always say to teachers, too. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're putting stuff on kids' paper, you don't know how a parent is going to interpret that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. What's your explanation for it? Yeah. Or, you know, mama might have had a bad day. That mm -hmm. just might throw her over the edge. Well, I mean, and how many, how many times know. do you receive a text message right. and you didn't hear the way they said it? Right. And so you don't know if it's snarky, right. if it's nice, nice, if it's frustrated, resentful, mm -hmm. positive. They could, it could be all kinds of things. Right. Like, what if they meant it like this? 
Mm -hmm. So having multiple interpretive strategies then allows us to step back from our initial hobby to so what seems natural mm -hmm. and say, what if I thought about it from this perspective, this perspective, or this perspective, right. mm -hmm. then I might, then I might understand it better. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so, uh, so, so then an, uh, a successful version of this would be like, oh, Tyrone, that's so nice. You gave the boys a star, mm -hmm. right? And that's a great thing. An unsuccessful thing would be if somebody heard that and immediately came and started ripping into Tyrone about how mean he was. Without understanding. Without understanding the meaning. This is why interpretation is important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, let's, so the last one, and actually we've done, we've done this before, and I'm gonna try and wrap, I'm gonna try and wrap it up a little bit, but we've done this before. I actually did this in a sermon. But we talked about the Tower of Babel, bringing it to, so we want to always bring it back to the Bible. So <laughs> we talked about the Tower of Babel, and um, I think most, most everybody who's on the call was, was there for, for the Tower of Babel reading. Um, I, I can pull it up, but the question I asked was, um, and let me get to that screen. The question I asked during that um, during that sermon was, what do, how do we know what the Tower of Babel story is about? How do we know if it's a good or a bad thing? So I'm just going to, I'm just going to read this, right? So it says, now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Okay, so we often in our, in our tradition of interpretation, the Tower of Babel is what? A negative thing. It's a negative thing, right? Mm -hmm. They had hubris, and so they were spread apart across the across the earth as a punishment. Mm -hmm. Now, this NIV translation leans into that leans into that a little bit, mm -hmm. but if we were to look at, let me see if I can get the NRSV up. No, nope, I'm having low quality on the thing. So let's see, where is the NRSV? And then, of course, it depends on which NRSV we use. But so let's look at the part where where it says what what God did. And the Lord said, "Look, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do for them." Okay. So I don't know if you noticed the difference, but he says, but it actually separates the statements out a little bit. Look, they are one people. They all have one language. This is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will be impossible for them. And if we go back to the NIV, they actually put a conjunction in here. It says, if they begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. And we put the conditional in there, it makes it feel like, possibly, that God doesn't like it. Right? Mm -hmm. If they're like this, then they will be able to do this. And it kind of gives a negative valence. That's just an interpret. That's an interpretive strategy. Mm -hmm. But the text itself in the Hebrew, if we we're really reading it in the same in the original language, also doesn't have any kind of clear valence of this is a bad thing. So let's get so let's get back to our questions. Do we know who wrote or spoke this? We don't know who wrote it. Tradition says that it was Moses. That's what the rabbis say. It was Moses. Mm -hmm. But 
as, mm -hmm. as, but but we don't ne we don't necessarily know that right it doesn't say and moses wrote this right. okay where does the person who wrote it come from well we know about scribal culture mm -hmm. and we know that it was produced by the hebrew people mm -hmm. right and eventually came down from and came down through interpretation history so we know it comes from somewhere between 800 bc and 200 bc okay. that's 600 years <laughs> what is the social or cultural location of the person who wrote it people all the time like to say oh this was the p source the priestly source or this was the j source there are a lot of ways that interpreters of the bible have tried to answer that question in order to be able to interpret it so if it was a priest who wrote this their social cultural location in the temple gives them certain advantages and they want to use they would want to use their authority and power to tell people and to kind of construct an identity for the hebrew people right so we don't know that but people will say that based on based on looking at the the next thing so then they will do that by saying what words were used so then people who are interpreting it or trying to say who the author was will say well this particular author in the Pentateuch, in the first five books of the Bible, uses these kinds of words or uses this kind of sentence structure, right? Uses this kind of language mm -hmm. or these kind of themes are important to them. Mm -hmm. And so they'll say, that's how I can say what who the author was, who, the, who spoke this, right? Rather than saying it was anonymous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> are there any words ambiguous, multivalence or abstract concepts in this? And, and we would say, yes, what, what does God mean when, when God says, there's nothing these people cannot do. Is that bad? Is that good? It was like the one star system. Mm -hmm. That's that's the gap that we're trying to fill. Mm -hmm. And the sentence structure, it can it could be fairly simple, but if you make it an if then statement, it's a little bit more complex. Mm -hmm. It gives you more interpretive possibilities. Um and then what is what is our hobby to? So we have to understand that our hobby to is 2000 years of tradition that tells us that the Tower of Babel was bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That separating people into different languages is bad. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, in our based in our culture, I don't know if you've ever heard somebody, I've heard this, like, if you've ever heard somebody say like, like a racist thing to a Hispanic person saying, we live in an English speaking country, you need to learn how to speak English. Mm -hmm. That's in our culture, even though we don't ascribe to that it's still part of our habitus. Mm -hmm. That English is the main language and that other languages are not necessarily accepted as standard languages for, for things. And so we might interpret that as, as multiple languages being a bad thing. And then what do we have to know to make this statement make sense? Mm -hmm. What do we have to, we have to know all about the people who created it. We, there are, a million things that we have to know in order to interpret this properly and that's a daunting task but what's less daunting i think is how do i apply this if i if i say to myself there are a lot of things i can't know so i have to take multiple interpretive strategies or i can look at it from multiple different lenses mm -hmm. to try and come up with which one, which one can I apply the best? Which one adds the most value? How is this going to affect my future action if I look at it this way or I look at it this way? What might I do or how might I respect, re, re, react or respond given this information? How will it make me feel about myself and other people if I interpret it this way or this way or this way? What did I learn? if I interpret it this way or this way or this way. And then finally, did it lead to a good result? What's the result of my interpretation? Am I treating now from my hobby tooth, right? As I said, make people making feel it, people feel the love of God and wholeness within themselves is one of my is, is, is a good for me. For another person, their good might be that person repented and they came back to and they came back to the lord that might be their good yeah. mm -hmm. you know and 
All other collateral damage doesn't matter as long as they're a sheep or a goat and we can decipher which one they are, right? But that's part of their hobby too. That's part of their culture, their cultural understanding of what the Bible is supposed to do. So then our results can be different. Our, our good and bad results can be different. All right. So I'm just going to wrap this up. I'm, I'm just going to kind of put a nice little bow on this and, and we'll get out of here in the next. Uh, so I said it would take an hour to an hour and 15 minutes and we're coming up in an hour and 15. Thanks for everybody sticking around. So what I want to say is what we can know about what people mean when they speak requires lots and lots of background knowledge. Even to know what we, we ourselves mean, or, or, or when we looked at our picture, requires lots of background knowledge. How you interpret things naturally when there is a gap or ambiguity is ultimately based on who you are. It's based on where you come from, your life experiences, your society, your culture, your identity within your culture, where you fit in in your culture, your memories, your morals, your religion and sometimes on what has happened in your life that day. These are all part of your habitus and the systems and structures that have created your society's habitus. So all the different structures that we interact with on a daily basis affect our habitus. So our habitus again is, they're the things that go without saying. They're just natural to us. And interpretation is all about how you as an individual and we as a group can come to understand a speech act in order to apply it to our lives or yield some benefit from encountering it as a text. If we can't escape our hobby twos, our natural reading of the text, and we don't know the full intention or meaning of an author's speech act, then it will help us to have some strategies to aid us in applying and reading the texts for our lives. And this is especially true for texts that we read as scripture, texts that have been transmitted to have some sort of divine wisdom that we're supposed to find. Texts especially that are a place where we find God is still communicating with us today. Right, so if we're decoding a text, we're just looking for what God may have said before. When we interpret, we're, we're, we're often looking for what God is leading us toward. Mm -hmm. How can God continue to speak to us? So over the next few weeks, we're going to learn different strategies, and they're called methodologies or criticisms for reading biblical texts. These range on a spectrum from decoding to interpreting, from scientific type approaches to reader-centric approaches, and sometimes even revolutionary approaches. So we're going to get ready for, for some fun. And I'm going to close by saying next week we'll be discussing textual criticism. And so I'm going to keep on trying to make sure that we have some sort of interactive stuff because some of them can be really didactic and boring, but I'm going to try and make them interesting. So with that, I'm going to say thank you everybody for, for coming tonight. We got out in exactly an hour and 15 minutes. And so I'm happy about that. And I can't wait to see everybody next week when we talk about textual criticism. And thanks for helping with me with my PhD, um, with, my, uh, with my PhD. If you ever have anything where you're like, that doesn't really make sense, Chris, then, then that will help me to have to go back and, and reconsider. So even that will be a positive. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording. And I'm going to stop sharing. Up, sign me up for the Christian Jubilee. Write my name on the roll. I've been changed, I've been changed since the Lord has lifted me. I want to be. <laughs>
lifted me. 